Start recording. Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to CS196 lecture number 26. Uh, it's actually our last lecture. So um, normally today we talk about concurrency, um, but we're, we're actually changing plans a little bit. Uh, we've been reading a lot of the feedback form, uh, and, and we believe that the homeworks were probably harder than we wanted them to be kind of throughout the entire course. We know we had uh, kind of one or two really um, painful homeworks in there, but this is going to be a uh, uh, mostly what we're or rather let's talk a little bit about what we're doing. So again, um, uh, just some course wrap up stuff. First is congratulations to making it to the end of the semester. I hope that you all are um, starting to prepare for your finals. Of course, we do not have a final in this class, uh, and so hopefully you can relax a little bit with that. Study hard for your other ones. Um, make sure to fill out the feedback form. Uh, we put it in announcements. It's free points, uh, so there's literally no reason not to do it. Um, also, you know, it helps us make this class uh, a better place. Um, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of the feedback forms we've been reading, and that's a big reason why we're, we're kind of making this change that you're about to hear in uh, the next slide. Um, if you don't want to put your net ID, if you want it to be anonymous, that's fine. Um, just don't put your net ID and then screenshot the form submission uh, uh, and just let Matt and I know, um, you know, send that to us so that we can see that you submitted the form uh, and we won't see kind of which one is yours. Okay, so normally this lecture is concurrency too. Um, personally, uh, you know, I really like concurrency, but uh, I think that it's going to be more valuable to um, reopen the homeworks, and then we're going to spend actually pretty much the entirety of this lecture reviewing past homeworks that people had some trouble on, uh, in the hopes that you know you can find some time, ideally, you know, when you're not busy during finals, to um, you know, go back and uh, get some extra credit on on those um, homeworks. Uh, they're reopening for full credit. Uh, they're going to be open until May 14th, 11.59 p.m. Um, we aren't reopening homework 7, which was debugging, because that was a bad homework and we're not happy with it. Uh, and so, again, I, I think we mentioned this way, way back, is we're just giving people full credit for that. Everyone gets full credit for that homework. Um, and just a quick reminder, uh, homework 6, which is the front end, and 10, which was ML, were manually graded. Uh, and so if you do resubmit those and you want it to be you know, graded, uh, let Matt or I know. Um, if you don't want the tic-tac-toe answers to be revealed yet, then uh, close the stream when we get there, um, is, is what someone said. Um, that being said, uh, you know, um, I don't think it hurts. So, um, you know, we're actually just kind of going to hop right into it. Um, we're going to skip bash and git because people did really well on those. Um, so what we're going to focus on is, I believe, the pythons and the rusts uh, is the big stuff. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I put in here. I can't remember. I don't think so. Um, and so basically how this is going to work is we're going to go through these together. Um, again, you know, if you have any questions, we're reviewing stuff from months ago. Uh, and so I encourage you to ask questions, um, you know, so that, you know, people can uh, watch this either live or recorded. And, you know, if they haven't done these, uh, have the ability to go back and do it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Python homework one, question one, type check. And so in this type check function, uh, this is kind of the problem statement here. And this is how a lot of these slides are, are laid out as problem statement here, and then some code down here or up here with some pseudocode. And so let's just discuss a little bit. So what this type check function does, it takes in three arguments and it returns the number of times whatever uh, has the most type occurs. Uh, I probably didn't word that very correctly, but um, we can look at an example here. If we're past two Boolean values in an integer, uh, then we want to return two because Boolean, which occurs the most times, occurs two times. Um, one moment. I, I do need to uh, go into presenter mode for this. There we go. That's better. So I can control it from over here. This, this up, Python 1 1, full screen. All right, sorry about that.
Okay. Um, I also have some bash stuff at the very end if we if we have extra time, but I don't think we'll get there, and I don't necessarily think we need to get there because uh, I think most people did very well on bash. Okay. Do I have everything up? Okay. So um, let's talk about uh, uh, this one. So um, kind of let's pseudocode it. And so first thing is we want to say is if anything is none, if anything is none type, uh, then just return zero, right? Um, and, you know, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, you know, we have three different arguments, uh, and, and if you want to check if any of them are none, um, I, I think an if statement is the easiest way to do it, right? Just in Python, you can always say if blank is none, uh, you know, do this certain thing, right? So hopefully that's pretty straightforward. I changed the size again. Okay, um, otherwise, what we need to do is let's kind of break this problem down. First, we need a way to check the types for each variable then we want to kind of count how many times each of those things occur and we want to return how many times that occurs. Um, there's you know tons of different ways to do this. Um, I think one of the easiest ways is probably just to uh, look at each type or to treat each type as a list or to put each type into a list uh, and iterate over it and just you know mark down the type. Of course you know at this point in the semester we did learn about the type function where you can pass you know, some variable into the type function and it will return you uh, the type of that variable rather than you know, other stuff. Will Python 3 be open? And so, uh, so Eli, great question. Everyone gets full credit for Python 3, which was debugging uh, because we aren't really happy with that homework. Um, and so we, we don't want people going back and doing that during finals because uh, we don't want, we want you focusing on your actual finals. So, um, you know, we, we mentioned kind of way back when that, that everyone was getting full credit for that homework. Uh, that remains the case. Uh, so we actually are not opening it back up uh, because uh, we don't want people spending time on that uh, instead of other finals. I guess if you want us to open it up, we could, um, like just to, to do it. Uh, I mean, at that point, I'll just like send it to you <laughs> if you want it. Um, okay, good question. So um, back to this, we have type of X, which is how we can check what the type is. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, a couple different ways to do this. I think probably uh, the easiest way is just to uh, essentially make a list and say, you know, this is this type, this type, this type. Uh, and then to essentially just say, um, how many times does this type occur? How many times does this type occur? How many times does this type occur? Or, you know, there's, there's different ways of doing it. Um, because it's only three items, this is probably uh, an easy way. Right, and then to get the maximum of those three numbers, uh, which, you know, if, if two of the types are the same, so if this is the same as this, these will both be two, uh, and obviously the maximum will be two as well. So a couple different ways to approach this problem. Uh, I think the real magic in doing this, or, or the real kind of hint, is being able to use this type function and kind of moving from a list of the values to a list of the types to a list of the uh, number of times that type occurs. Okay, um, so let's go to Python 1.2. Um, this is fizzbuzz in, in Python. Uh, kind of a classic coding problem. Maybe you've seen it before. Maybe you will see it when you're doing um, some interview questions. Uh, the way that uh, our fizzbuzz works is we pass you an integer that we're calling length, and we want you to return us a list uh, that has essentially strings in it, right? And let's look a little bit at this list. So what we want to do Sorry, apologies. Um, so what we want to do is basically uh, for every, we want to create a list that is uh, length elements long and depending on the index uh, in that list, we want the string to be something different. And so if the index is a multiple of three, we want it to say fizz. If the index is a multiple of five, we want it to say buzz. If it's a multiple of three and five, so 15, we want it to say fizz buzz. Uh, and if it's neither of those, so you know, two, four, you know, whatever, uh, we want it to say neither. And so a couple ways to do this. First thing, you know, just verify that length is, is proper and we can work with it. Um, you know, the next major step is let's start iterating. So we'll put a for loop and, you know, we know that for every element in this for loop, we want to add something to the array. Uh, and so what we can do, you know, there's a couple different approaches. 
uh, you know, one way to do it is to kind of build a string um, from the beginning to the end. So maybe you start with neither, or maybe you start with a blank string, I mean, uh, you know, if it's a multiple of three, make it say fizz. If it's a multiple of five, make it say buzz. If it's a multiple of both, make it say fizz buzz. Uh, and if it's, you know, none of those things else, uh, you, you can make it say neither. Um, really, the two magic parts here is using if-else statements in Python, as well as, I guess, using a loop. Um, depending on your implementation, you know, maybe you implement it with kind of string math where you, you, you know, you, you say, like, uh, my current string plus fizz, um, which can handle some edge cases with, like, fizz and buzz. But, yeah, I encourage you all, um, you know, give this one a shot. Uh, you know, most of these early Python ones are pretty straightforward. Um, this one especially is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, we, we kind of give you a little bit of a hint uh, for this one. Um, what we want to do is uh, call this length function, which is going to call length on whatever you pass it. But uh, we want to be able to pass anything to this function. And so, um, you know, if we pass, uh, if we try, you know, for example, if we do normal Python and you try to do length of five, uh, an error occurs excuse me, an error occurs, and we don't like errors. So, uh, you know, we would really prefer not to do that, not to, not to have our program crash. Um, and so instead, we're building this length function, which is going to handle that. Um, really, the magic here is just using a try except block, right? Um, if, you know, this, if essentially calling length on this thing does not error out, then we're good, and we can return that. Uh, if there's an exception, then we want to return negative one. So hopefully this one's pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about uh, maybe some more complex uh, Python problems. Um, the first one of which is going to be uh, collinearity, or check collinearity, which is Python 1.4. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what this problem is actually saying. So we're passed in uh, points. We're passed in a list of points. Uh, these points are a list uh, or a, a 2D list. And so we have something like this, where we have, you know, x, y, x, y, we'll say dot, dot, dot. Um, you know, we, we don't know how many of them there are, of course. Okay, um, and so the way we can look at this visually, of course, is if we actually have kind of our, our graph, right, each of these can be mapped to a point on that graph, maybe one here, maybe one here, maybe one here, right? Um, with this collinearity function, what we want to do is see if they all lie on some line. And so, you know, uh, these do not lie on uh, a single line because, you know, we can see there's two different lines there. But uh, these, if I can draw it well, do lie on a single line. And so then we would want it uh, to return true, or true comma, uh, or true comma the slope. Apologies. OK. Um, and so um, let's talk about kind of one possible way to solve this. And I think uh, kind of an easy to understand way of solving it is we'll start with just uh, one of the points. Apologies, one moment. Yeah, so we'll start with one of the points. It doesn't matter which point. Uh, we'll start with the first point because that's the easiest. Uh, and so we'll, we'll mark this point as blue. And then I'll mark the other points as yellow. Oh, that's kind of hard to see. Maybe I won't mark them as yellow. I'll mark them as green. OK, um, and so let's look at what we can do. Uh, one kind of way of approaching this problem is to first pick our, our, you know, zeroth index point, which we're marking as blue, and just find the slope to the next point. And so we'll find the slope to this first green point. Okay. And of course, you know, the way we find the slope, hopefully this isn't too surprising, you know, rise over run, y difference over x difference. Um, we do want to handle the case where you know, it's directly above, and so you might have to do some if statements to say if, you know, there is no x difference. Um, obviously, we can't divide by zero, so we have to handle that. So we just find the slope by doing essentially rise over run here, and we store that, okay? Then we move to the next point. 
we move to this point. And we keep our base point, and we do the same thing, rise over run, find the slope, and we can compare this uh, slope with the last slope that we found. And so as we're iterating through these points, all of the points except for the first, we can be storing these points or storing these slopes in a list of slopes, right? And so we have slope one, slope two, make that one bigger, um, slope one, slope two. Uh, and if at any point these two slopes are different, and so when we check this third point, we'll note that the slope is different, except I didn't draw that line very well. Uh, it's hard drawing with a mouse, so you'll have to uh, forgive me. We, we can check and we can say, okay, well, is this new slope that I'm about to add uh, different than the last slope here? And of course it would be, and so we could return, uh, you know, false that the points are not collinear. Now, of course, maybe more interestingly is if they are collinear. Um, so maybe if this point, this last green point isn't there. Um, the thing that we want to return is true, so that would mean, you know, we're finished iterating through our points. We've gotten through our for loop, uh, and we want to return also the slope. And so we return true, comma, you know, either slope 1 or slope 2, because we finished this for loop and haven't returned, we know that those two things are the same, right? Uh, and so, you know, once again, at kind of a higher level, the way I recommend a lot of you approach this problem is to pick the first point uh, as, you know, kind of your base point, and then to iterate over the, the future points, all of the other points in the list, and say, you know, hey, um, you know, is this point, uh, what, what is the slope from my base point to this new point? Uh, is this slope different than my last slope? Uh, if it is different, then, uh, you know, we're done. These points are not collinear. And if I get through my for loop, then these points are collinear. Um, you know, some stuff that you have to keep an eye out for is what if there's only one point? Um, you know, we, we probably, or rather, one point is not collinear with itself, and so we would just return false. Uh, that's, uh, some math majors probably are going to get mad at me for that. Maybe they are collinear, but we're going to return false, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so, you know, um, Yeah, we also want to handle the edge cases where they're, you know, collinear, but they're collinear vertically, and so the slope is undefined, uh, in which case we return true, comma, none, um, and, you know, so on and so forth. I, I like the pen feature. I use the pen feature with other things. It's, uh, it's handy. Maybe it's hard to read, but... I, I thought the pen feature would be a nice addition to some of these problems because it makes it a little bit easier to visualize. Maybe you feel the same, maybe not. I'm using it anyway, so you can't stop me. <laughs> okay, um, so great, that's, that's Python 1 kind of done. Uh, and so let's now start talking a little bit about Python 2. Um, we'll, we'll move right into it. Uh, we have a function that we want to call odd squares that follows the specification. Uh, below. Um, I don't have the code box here because this is a one-liner. Um, we want the function to return a list. And uh, we want to use a list comprehension for that to generate the list. Um, the way it works is we're provided with a single argument m. m is an integer that is greater than or equal to zero. And we want to, so if m is 3, for example, we want our list to contain the square of every odd integer. Uh, and so we would say 1 squared, which is, of course, 1, and then 3 squared, because we, we're inclusive here, okay? Uh, which, of course, would be 9. So we would, in the end, want to return 1, 9. Uh, and so let's think a little bit about how we would do this with a list comprehension. Um, hopefully, you know, we can break this down into its pieces. Um, obviously, we want to iterate over something. Uh, that thing that we want to iterate for over is all of the numbers uh, between, you know, essentially 0 inclusive and, or yeah, 0 inclusive and m inclusive. Um, one thing to watch out for is if you just said, you know, for i in range m, uh, that's actually non-inclusive of m, right? If we say for i in range 3, it'll go 0, 1, 2. And so our last example would fail. 
So, um, you know, make sure to handle that kind of edge case. Um, you know, one thing you can do is, is there's kind of two major ways of approaching uh, this next part, which is we only want the odd integers. Uh, and so either you can, um, you know, iterate over every other integer in M, or you can uh, filter them out using the predicate. Uh, it's up to you. Um, you know, either one's fine. Um, I think for me, the predicate is probably, uh, I like using it. I think it's a little bit more Pythonic, but, you know, it, it really actually doesn't matter at all. Uh, and so, you know, what defines a number being odd? Well, of course, you know, mod 2 uh, equals 1, or equals equals 1, maybe I should say. And then when that is true, so we iterate over this for loop, when this case is true, what do we want to return? Of course, we want to return, uh, you know, uh, i squared, essentially. Okay, so hopefully this one's pretty straightforward as well. Um, the next function that we're going to talk about is uh, sq. Um, what we want to do here is we want to look at what two-character substring occurs the most in some string. And so we can look at some examples here. We have a, b, a, b, a, b, a, b. Of course, you know, this substring a, b occurs the most times, four times. b, a occurs second, uh, you know, three times. Um, in this string here, x, y occurs the most. In this one here, 1, 2 occurs the most. And of course, in this one, a, a occurs the most. Now, there's a lots of different ways of approaching this problem, but this is, uh, whoops, this is kind of a problem that you'll probably run into a lot, or at least a, a pattern of solving this problem that you'll use a lot. And so uh, a very easy way to do it, and a, a way I highly recommend, is to use a dictionary uh, to keep track of what you've seen uh, as the key and how many times you've seen it as the value. So, you know, first thing, uh, you know, if w is empty, we, we want to return none. Um, or I think, yeah, if w is empty, you should return none. Um, and then let's just start iterating over the characters or the indexes. Uh, either one's fine. Uh, we want to get the two character substring. So um, hopefully you remember how to do this with array slicing. Um, if we've seen that substring before, then we want to keep track of how many times we've seen it. And if not, we can just add it to our list. And, and maybe list was a bad word to say here. Uh, we can add it to our dictionary to keep track. Of course, if you want to use a list, you could here. Uh, it's definitely not impossible. Um, but I suggest you, uh, you use a dictionary. And the reason for that is we can very easily say, you know, our substring AB, for example, has been seen, uh, you know, we'll start it at uh, one times. Uh, of course, you know, we, we only, set it to one uh, when we add it here, right? Now, I guess uh, we wouldn't set everything to zero. I, you could set every combination of two characters to zero, but that's probably pretty inefficient, right? Uh, and so every time we see a new two substring, uh, two character substring, we add it to this list. Um, you know, some edge cases to watch out for, make sure you don't iterate over the end. Uh, and so obviously, you know, uh, if our string is a, b, C, we only have two two-character substrings, A, B, and B, C. If we try to get C, uh, you know, something, then uh, bad things are going to happen, probably. And so we have this dictionary that's now storing all of our substrings and how many times we saw those substrings. We'll say B, C. I think this is actually an impossible string, but don't worry about it. Um, and so all we want to do now is uh, get whatever substring we saw the most. And, you know, again, lots of different ways to approach this problem. Uh, maybe remember that you can use dot items to get the tuple of, uh, you know, key comma value. And then you can just see what has the greatest value. Um, there's, there's, again, different ways to do this. The max function allows you to uh, kind of do this inherently if you want to look at the documentation for that. But you have to tell it that you want to max on this. So... Um, different ways to do it. Uh, and then finally, we just want to return the substring and the number of times we saw that substring. So hopefully uh, pretty straightforward. Thanks, Welby. I just saw you uh, push that. Uh, can you also, actually, I don't know if he's listening. I'll message him later. I was going to make him add to the message. Okay, um, so let's look at this next one, which is repeat sums. Um, what we want to do here is we want to return an int given a list uh, of numbers, 
uh, we want to sum all of the values which appear more than once in numbers. Uh, and so maybe this is a little confusing. Let's look at it here. So in this situation, two appears multiple times and three appears multiple times. And so we want to return two plus three, which of course is equal to five. In the second list, only one appears multiple times, and so we would return one. In this last list, two appears multiple times, four appears multiple times, and six, and so we return two plus four plus six, which is, uh, of course, 12. So this one's maybe uh, kind of sneakily difficult sometimes. Uh, it can be a little bit tough to get started on it. Um, and so um, I, I wanna kind of start by building on this hint uh, and, and kind of maybe leading you in the right direction, which is we're provided with some list of numbers. Uh, we'll say our list is two, two, four, four, six, six, eight. If we convert this list to a set, uh, what's gonna happen, right? Well, you know, sets have the property that either an item exists or it doesn't exist. We don't really care about how many times it exists. And so what we would get, I believe the set notations with curly braces, is we'd get this. Now, my question to you is what's the difference between these? And when I say difference, I mean, you know, quite literally, uh, you know, what is the difference? Uh, if we remove these items from this list, what do we get? Two, four, six, exactly. And you know, maybe more generally, you know, what we get is all of the numbers that are duplicates, right? Uh, if anything occurs only once, like eight, uh, it's removed. It no longer exists, right? And so the thing that we are left with is all of the duplicates. And so in this situation, we'd be left with two, four, six. In the case of the ones, we'd be left with you know one, 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 one. Okay, well, we're pretty close. We know what numbers are doing duplicates now, uh, but you know we only want to add one of these numbers. And so we can do the same trick again, which is now we can turn this into a set. And when we turn this into a set, you know, 246 remains 246. But one, you know, all of those get collapsed into the same, uh, you know, one for lack of a better statement. And so what we have here is a list or a set, I guess, of all of the unique items that have been duplicated that show up more than once, right? And of course, that's what we want. We can directly sum those variables and return that value. Great, um, let's go ahead and look at this next one. Uh, this next one's using dictionaries and kind of uh, working with dictionaries. And so that's kind of the big topic here. Um, this can be done with a list comprehension or without a list comprehension. Um, we'll look at it without a list comprehension, but I guess, you know, uh, kudos to you if you can do it without one. Um, the big thing to do is, or the big task is we are given a list of these dictionaries and we want to return a sorted list of the names. And so what we can do is iterate over these dictionaries, this list of dictionaries, I should say, uh, dot, 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 right? We don't know how many dictionaries there are. And get the name for each. Append that name to a separate list. My, I think my mouse handwriting isn't that bad. But maybe I jinxed myself. So we can append those names to a list. And then we can just directly sort that list. And of course, um, you know, this one's pretty straightforward. Um, maybe the big question is how do you actually get those values? Uh, I encourage you to look back to Python 2 uh, to how to get the values for a certain key in a dictionary. Um, as for, you know, appending them to a list, hopefully you know how to do that. And for sorting a list, um, you know, uh, I won't spoil it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward though. Um, I'm sure if you Google sort a list in Python, you can find some helpful functions that are built in. So let's talk about one of the one of the problems or one of the uh, 
uh, homeworks that people started to have a little bit more trouble with. Um, this first one being the validate e or the, the web API. Uh, and in this web API, which was kind of one large problem, uh, we had three separate, or, or rather we had um, five kind of separate tasks. The first one being validate email, phone, the get, the delete, and the post. So let's look at these one at a time. Um, for these first two, validate email and phone, um, again, you can use re.match to actually match a certain regex function to a string you're provided. Um, what I want to discuss more is, is how we actually write that regex. And so in this situation, we want to validate an email. What do we know about the email? Well, we know it follows this format, user at domain. User is all alphanumeric characters and, or underscores. Domain is only alphanumeric characters and ends with a .com, .net, .gov, or .edu. Uh, and so let's kind of break this down piece by piece. Let's start with the user. Let's Well, actually, let's start with the beginning of the string. Um, of course, it's kind of usually good practice in regex to say, yeah, sorry, uh, is our front end homework being graded? Yeah, so your front end homework should have been graded, uh, and it it's, should be on GitHub rather than on Prairie Learn. Um, if it's not there, uh, shoot me a message. Um, in either case, uh, you know, we want to start with the beginning of the string, so that's where we'll start. And for this first part, we want to match all alphanumeric characters or underscores. And of course, we want to match one or more of those, right? And so, um, does anyone remember kind of the syntax for this? Actually, I'll probably just spoil it instead. Um, the syntax for this is, of course, you know, I want to match anything in this set and then we can use the plus sign to say one or more times. Now, you know, what, what is the stuff we want to match? Well, all uh, alpha, being, you know, the alphabet, of course. Also numeric, 0 to 9, or underscores. So all alphanumeric characters. Now, of course, you know, maybe this is familiar, maybe this isn't. This is a 0. Maybe that made it more confusing. I don't know how to write zeros the proper way. Um, you know, uh, an equivalent thing in Rust is the, the backslash w. Um, these two things are just the exact same. So you can just use backslash w here um, if you wanted to instead. Okay, so after the user part, we have an at symbol, so we can just match that directly. And then we want to match only uh, alphanumeric characters and not an underscore. Uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, easy backslash w for this, so we will have to do it like this, 0 through 9, uh, no underscore, of course, once or more, right? Finally, uh, we want to check if it ends with a .com, .net, .gov, or .edu. Uh, the way we can do this is say, okay, well, we know that there's going to be a period, and then it's going to be one of these things. And so we can make uh, these capture groups, if you remember. And of course, the end of the string comes right after. And of course, what comes in this capture group, what are we matching? Well, we're either matching .com, of course, the dot's over here, so it's just com, or the pipe is how you do or, go, or I should say net next. Uh, I think you get the idea, and eventually, E, D, U, draw the pipes. Um, and so what this part's saying is I'm matching com or net or gov or edu. Uh, and if any of those things match, then I'm good. Okay, so great. We've talked about how to do the validate email. The validate phone is a lot easier. Um, one thing that I'll say just before we start is zero through nine is equal to backslash D. Uh, for digit. And so we're going to use backslash D instead. Uh, and so the way a phone is, uh, is the exact format that we see below, which is the beginning, rather that's the end, the beginning of the string, uh, three characters. So we can say backslash D exactly three times, and then a dash, uh, backslash D exactly three times, a dash, and then backslash D exactly four times. And then, of course, this is the end of the string, right? Okay, that's enough regex, regex. 
I'm trying to say regex because I was wrong, and apparently it's pronounced regex. Uh, cheers to whoever mentioned that in the comments on one of our YouTube videos that one time, uh, if you're watching this. Uh, Mir, you just missed it. <laughs> Seconds away. Um, unfortunate for you. Um, but we're going over the rest of it right now, or at least we covered the first two parts, which were the actual regex. Now we're covering the uh, the uh, web API stuff. So let's first talk about Git. Wow, we're running uh, kind of late. Um, if I don't finish here, then I'm going to record the rest of this and upload it for people who need to redo it. Uh, and so um, we cover Rust 1, 2, and 3 as well. Um, I did not think I would be this slow, but I am. Um, and so I'll probably end up recording portions of that and uploading it to YouTube right after. We'll post it on the website and whatnot as well. Um, of course, it's not required. Um, real quick, how excited are you for this summer? I just want to make sure that we get to attendance. And so I'll, I'll open this up. Uh, lecture start. Um, how excited are you? Oh, I put a slash, but that's fine. So five is super excited, one is not. We're only uh, 10 days away. So hopefully you all are, are super excited for the summer coming up. Um, you know, react to the poll. Uh, maybe if you're taking summer classes, you're a little bit less excited, but you know, make sure to click that. Uh, make sure we get attendance through that way. Okay, so let's um, go on the wrong way. So I'll just leave that up for a bit. And while we do that, we'll talk about the Git. So for the Git stuff, um, one pattern that we're going to see in all of these is we want to check if some parameter is provided and do something uh, based on that. The easiest way to do that is to say if, um, or rather first, let me introduce this idea of request.args. Uh, request, oh gosh, oh gosh, don't look. Got ahead of myself. Request.args is a dictionary of the arguments. So we'll say, you know, key value. Uh, and so, of course, if we want to check if something exists in that dictionary, we can literally just say uh, if key in dictionary. In our situation, we want to know if the user ID argument is provided. So we can say if user ID in request.args do this thing, otherwise do this other thing. So let's say that the user ID is not provided. We want to return all users. How do we return all users? Well, the first thing we need to do is get all users with our database. Of course, get all users is a function of the database. So we have to call db dot get all users. Uh, some people ran into that bug. Uh, and this is going to return us a list of users. Ah, very nice, very nice. Um, we want to then convert the users from this user class. And because we, so because we want to pass this to our front end, uh, we want to end up JSONifying it. Um, we can only JSONify dictionaries. So what we'll say is for each user in this uh, list of users, uh, we can call user.todict. And then we can call JSONify on that entire list. And that will give us what we want. Additionally, we can you know, say uh, the return code comma 200 because uh, we were successful. So that's the major steps for that part. If the user ID is provided, then we have to do a couple steps. First, check the database for the user by calling db.containsUser. Then, uh, you know, kind of the same thing. We then need to actually get the user using the user ID. That will return us the user uh, class. User class needs to be converted to a dictionary, so we call user.todict. And then finally, we call JSONify on the, on the dictionary, and we can return that uh, comma 200. So it'll be something along the lines of like JSONify, uh, you know, my user dot to dict. Um, yeah. Depending on how you do it, you could probably do it all in one line if you were crazy. Um, let's look next at delete, uh, a similar pattern. If user ID is not provided, return an error. So, uh, you know, once again, if user ID not in request.args, then we want to return the bad request, which I believe is uh, error code 400. If it is provided, we need to do a couple steps. First, check the database for the user. If the user exists, then we want to call delete user. And then uh, we want to return kind of this little dictionary right here, 
uh, just user ID and then you know the user ID that we just deleted. Um, and we obviously JSONify that and the return code would be 200. So hopefully pretty straightforward there. Um, the post is maybe sometimes a little longer, maybe sometimes not. Uh, it's probably more lines of code, but it's a little repetitive. So um, a, a big majority of it is this. If name in request.args, if username in request.args, if email in request.args, if phone number in request.args, uh, if any of those are not there, then uh, we want to return bad request. If they all are there, we want to validate the email using our validate email function. We then want to validate the phone number. Uh, then we want to construct a new user. And so, of course, the way we you construct a class in Python is by calling user and passing the parameters into the user class. The parameters that we need is name, username, email, phone number. So make sure to pass them in in that right order. Or someone had that wrong and had some trouble with it. Then we now have our, you know, we have our user uh, object. We now need to uh, call add user, db.add user. And so we pass the user object into add user. This will return us with the user ID, and we use that user ID to once again make that dictionary, JSONify it, and return it, uh, just like the other one. Okay, um, so we're back to this, and so I'll close this poll now. Um, hopefully, I'm expecting a wonderful, wonderful uh, summer expectations from all of you, so let's see. Yeah, lots of fives. Let's go. Tons of fives. A little couple threes, couple threes. Um, but you know, that's okay. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the summer surprises you with how great it's going to be. Nothing below a three. So that's, uh, that's good. Okay, um, so great work there. Let's kind of continue with it. Um, once again, I'll mention if I don't get through the end, uh, I will be recording the rest of this. And it, actually, I'll probably just keep going. Uh, you can just leave at 750, but to make my life easier and to have it all in the same recording, uh, I'm just going to keep going. Of course, you know, this isn't necessarily a, a, a required lecture, quote unquote. Um, if you've already done these homeworks, then this, I guess, kind of isn't for you. Um, but uh, I'll probably just keep going. So uh, I think that's what I'll do instead of stopping the stream and, and restarting or restarting the recording. Um, so um, once it hits 750, feel free to leave. Um, so this Rust 1.1 is pretty uh, straightforward. Um, you know, if we remember the, the kind of last thing that we have in a Rust function is what's returned. Uh, I, I probably won't spoil this one, but uh, you do A times B. Uh, that's actually it. <laughs> you, you literally just do A times B. Um, so hopefully you can uh, type those three characters. Um, so let's then do fizzbuzz in um, Rust. We did it in Python not too long ago. Yeah, it's just uh, a, that was the last one, yeah, that's it. yeah, <laughs> sorry, Sean, I, I hope that you didn't have trouble with that one. Um, so there, uh, let's see, um, fizzbuzz in uh, Rust now. So, um, you know, the way we can do this is similar. Uh, obviously, we want to create a vector. One note is, uh, you know, we probably want this vector to be mutable. Um, and so, you know, we probably should uh, keep that in mind. Say, you know, probably let mutable be, but I'll, you know, leave that one to you. Sorry, apologies. I keep uh, closing stuff. Um, kind of the big part in this, or the two major parts in this, is using if-else logic in Rust and also doing a for loop in Rust. So I'll remind you all, a for loop is done like this, for, you know, index in zero dot dot length, uh, and, you know, curly brackets. And, you know, if-else statements are uh, actually basically the exact same. So, you, you know, you can say if blah blah blah, uh, else if... Let me add my curly brackets. I know they're not great. Else if blah blah blah. And so you know, once again, just make sure you're handling your case if it's divisible by uh, five and three. So you know, maybe you know, one way to do that is to handle the fifteen case. Else handle the five case. Else handle the three case. Else uh, it's neither, right? So hopefully that one's pretty straightforward. I don't think that one's too hard. Finding the max in an array is, is very similar. This one um, is is basically the same. 
Um, first thing we want to do is, is get a starting value. You can either use, you know, the absolute int min, um, which is, you know, just Google uh, Rust get minimum integer, or you can just use the first value in the array, either one's fine. And then just iterate over the array uh, and, and say, you know, for, for i in r, if i is less than max, then max equals i. Now, there's actually a problem with this right now. Um, and that's, you know, when we're in, oh, wow, I just noticed how bad this handwriting is. Apologies. Um, the issue with this right now is that, uh, you know, if you're iterating over a list like this, you, you do need to kind of dereference the i. And so there's two ways to do that. Uh, either we can say it like this. So if, you know, the value of the i is greater than max, max equals the value of the i. Or uh, we can say if i is uh, greater than, you know, uh, destructuring max, um, this just basically... Uh, you know, says figure it out compiler, max, we still need to just get the value of i. So, you know, dereference it there. So, you know, um, that's one thing that we'll see a lot, and especially I think we'll see in Rust 2, is, uh, uh, you know, kind of these bugs of iterating over lists and, and using destructuring correctly, the, the and. Yeah, debugging is not coming back, ever. <laughs> Smile. Didn't we, uh... oh, I didn't change the title, uh, apologies. Uh, this one is uh, finding the distance between points, or finding the average distance between a single point and a list of points. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, this one isn't too crazy either. Probably, you know, we, we get some total value. We'll, we'll just call it total. I'll just kind of pseudocode this. And then, you know, for each point, Uh, you know, calculate the distance uh, and add it to total. Now, of course, you know, the distance formula we all know is, you know, x, uh, x1 minus x2 squared, uh, y1 minus y2 squared. I'm not going to write it out. It's, it's too many small characters for me to write well and it'd be legible. Um, the big question that I want to ask you is when we have p here, you know, p is equal to a tuple of x, y. The way you actually get this x is, of course, by saying p dot zero. The way you get the y is saying p dot one. You know, so it's basically the same as indexing in that sense. We can use the dot. It's, I guess, a little handier. Um, and so that's actually how you get the values. And so, you know, if we wanted to actually write this out, it could be something like, uh, you know, p dot zero minus base. Of course, base is our base point dot zero, which is the x value for that. Uh, you know, square that, uh, sum it, square root the whole thing. Um, you all you all know how to do that, hopefully. Okay, we're on Rust 2. Looks like we're not going to get to tic-tac-toe on time, but we will get to tic-tac-toe not on time. Uh, yeah, dereferencing de is, um, so dereferencing is like kind of one of those weird concepts in Rust. Um, it's a little bit like borrowing, um, to be honest, whenever I write Rust, I kind of just use the dereference tool, the, the and, to be like, uh, this is either a reference to this thing or it's this thing itself, uh, and I'm just going to let you figure it out. And so, uh, you know, usually it just kind of works. Um, that's probably not a great answer to it, though. I'm, I'm sure there's something fancier going on uh, below the hood. Um, it's a little bit like uh, uh, dereferencing in C, but not totally. So I, I don't want to um, be wrong about it. So um, let's fix the errors in this, and, and we'll see some examples of that, of dereferencing correctly. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of point you all in the right direction in each one. Uh, in this mean function, um, are we correctly looping over these? So, you know, do we dereference i in each? Um, I'll give you a hint. No, uh, the compiler will yell at you. Uh, it'll say this isn't right. Uh, and so you kind of have two options, the easier of which is just move this over here. Um, so for each, you know, for a reference to each one, I want to get the value and add it to sum. Um, of course, you know, there's something probably not great with line 12. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to figure out. Um, a hint that I'll give you is this is an integer, so we definitely need to cast as a float. Um, but are we casting as a float? Um, let's talk next about the standard deviation function. 
Um, I, again, the first question becomes, are we looping correctly? Uh, I'll give you a hint, we aren't. Uh, you know, these are going to be references to these eyes, so you either need to dereference them or de. Oh, what's the other term? Dereference or uh, d d something. Um, I can't remember the uh, the other term off the top of my head right now. But you know, those those two things work basically the exact same. Uh, the compiler. No, it's not deinitialize. That's not deallocate. It's the and. Dereference is the star. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I it doesn't super matter. Um, and then finally, are we actually correctly returning a uh, and references in C? Matt, shame on you. Um, are we correct? Is this correct as a float thirty-two? Uh, you know, this length is is. I'll give you a hint: not a float thirty-two. So we'll probably need to fix that. Um, last uh, or, or kind of this next example, um, we're doing. You know, float 32, float 32, returning a float 32. This is not a float 32. Hint, hint. And then finally, in this normalized function, um, uh, we can see we first get uh, num, or sorry, rather, okay, we have mean, which is a float 32. We have standard deviation, which is a float 32. We have num, which we're already dereferencing. I'm just going to call it. Uh, so, do we need to? Uh, use the star in those situations. Which of those situations do we need to? Do we need to use it in any? Um, you know, ask yourself and uh, figure it out. Uh, let's talk about Rust 2.2. So Rust 2.2 is uh, we we build a function that um, appends to a string. Um, the two big questions to do, or two, three, I guess, big topics uh, in building your own function is a: what is the syntax for writing a function in Rust? I'm sure you can find some inspiration from the other functions here. Uh, two, does our string parameter need to be mutable? Uh, it is probably makes our life a lot easier if it is, of course. Uh, and we can use some helpful built-in functions like push string, which appends to a string. In Python, it's a little bit like doing plus equals to a string. So um, I encourage you to look at the Rust documentation for that and make your life easier that way. Um, this is a... This checks if a certain string uh, says CS196. Um, and so hopefully uh, you all um, remember how to use if statements in Rust. Um, this one is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to hint too heavily, but I encourage you to remember ownership. Of course, in this situation, um, we're kind of throwing ownership back and forth between C and D. If we truly want C and D to still exist, uh, without deleting them, um, we probably need to find some way to clone S or copy S. Uh, so, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, this is uh, this function is when you where you can initialize a string that does not say CS one ninety six. So I don't know, pick uh, CS two two five or ECE three ninety one. I just had my final demo. Uh, with my, we built an operating system. So I think you all kind of do it in 241. So I don't know, pick whatever you want. Um, and then of course, uh, we don't edit this last one because uh, that's just to test it. Great, okay, so we're on tic-tac-toe. Um, I'm a little bit over, uh, but I think that I'll probably only end up going like 15 minutes or so over. So of course, if you all need to leave, leave. Um, we're going over tic-tac-toe now. Uh, so maybe this is helpful to the majority of you. Um, who are still here. Um, I could probably end the stream, but I guess I'll just leave it up uh, because there's no reason not to. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what's actually going on with tic-tac-toe. And let's start with this board idea. We have this board struct, and we're writing all of these functions in the board itself, or in the implementation of the board class. Uh, and so um, the board is two things. It's a 2D array of squares. Oh, I have the highlighter. It's a 2D array of squares. Uh, of course, you know, the first, you know, um, 2D array because we have uh, a grid here that we want to represent. Uh, and then we also have, you know, the current player, which is called uh, current underscore player. And so one of these squares, which is actually its own class, the square class, 
uh, has the player option. But uh, and, and rather, I, I should say it, it truly is an option. And option is kind of its own thing in Rust, where it can either be something or it can be nothing. If it's something, so if the option, and this is all kind of listed in the comments above, uh, if it's something, then it's going to be something of the player class, which we'll talk about in a second, or player uh, enumeration, or it's none. So either it's empty or a player has played there, right? Let's talk about the player class, or player enum. Uh, it's either X or it's O. That's it. Nothing fancy there. Okay, so uh, let's talk about kind of the different functions. So uh, one thing that I want to mention first is when we're kind of trying to get these informations and moving through, a big part of it is referencing and, and addressing these structs. So first one, uh, we're going to be talking about the helper function is move valid. Uh, this is optional. It makes your life easy. It makes your code cleaner. I suggest you do it. So the first thing that we can ask is what is in the move object? So we're, we're provided with something of the move class. Uh, the move class has two things, player which is, of course, of the player class, and position, which is a tuple of x, y. So what would make it invalid that we can work with here? First, uh, is the correct player playing? So the board has current player. Is current player equal to player? If not, uh, you know, this is not a valid move. Is this position out of bounds? Of course, it's, uh, you know, uh, three by three, which is zero, one, two, zero, one, two. So if either of these are greater than two, then uh, it's out of bounds or less than zero, I should say. Is the square already taken? Is that square taken already? Um, you know, if so, then uh, that's not, you know, valid. Uh, is the game over? Has someone already won? Uh, if so, once again, it's not valid. Um, is game over, of course, we'll use uh, the get winner function. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit. Okay, um, so the big thing that I want to kind of mention here is just uh, for an example, if we want to check if the square is taken, how do we do that? Well, you know, we're in the board class, so we can say self dot board. Board, of course, is getting this board object, or, or rather board uh, is, is what we call that, that 2D array, is what I should really call it. Uh, board is an attribute of the thing, where we have the you know, three positions, or the three, the three squares for each. It's kind of hard to draw that, so I won't. <laughs> Um, and you know the way we then you know index into it is is by normal with normal indexes. And so if you want to get the center, you could say you know one one. Of course, you know we probably want x y uh, because that's where this play is actually being played. Um, then you know uh, we, we actually have a square, and of course the square has a player attribute. And so now we can check directly is you know self dot board. We'll change this to x y. Um, you know, dot player equal to none or equal to player X or equal to player Y, you know, is it, what is it? Um, if it's some, if it's something, then, uh, you know, that, that, that square is already taken. So this kind of uh, behavior of accessing the board, accessing the indices, accessing the player is something that we'll, we'll see and we'll work with a lot. Um, okay, so we'll kind of keep moving. Uh, I want to do, hopefully, relatively quickly. We're almost done here. Let's talk next about the play move function. This is pretty short if you have the is move valid function. Um, you can either just put all the is move valid function code here or call is move valid. Um, of course, if the move isn't valid, then uh, do that, uh, handle that accordingly, which is in the documentation. I believe we return, uh, it's not none. What do we return if the move isn't valid? We return, yeah, we return none. Or, sorry, uh, if the move isn't valid, we return none. If uh, they play a move and it's not valid, we return error. Which has double parentheses because it 
it does. So that's pretty much it. If the move is valid, or if the move is invalid, return error. Otherwise, uh, set the board position to be the correct player. How do we set the board position to be the correct player? You know, same thing. Self.board xy. Of course, this xy is stored in this move struct. The move struct, uh, you know, um, has the player in the position, so we could say, you know, m dot pause dot zero is equal, to, or rather, we could say something along the lines of this, right? Okay, so self dot board x y, I should say, um, dot player equals, you know, uh, create our new player. And, you know, of course, in our situation there, it would just be uh, player colon colon x is how you do that. Or, you know, player colon colon uh, whoever is doing it. Of course, you know, the player is also stored in move, so I think we could probably just say m.player. Okay, so hopefully uh, that, that clears that up a little bit. And then finally, let's talk about uh, get winner. This is the longest um, but also it's a little bit repetitive. Um, we give you some code here, which uh, returns the correct information. Um, you can basically just copy and paste it. The only parts that you need to change is this, uh, and we'll talk about how you need to change this in a second. So first thing that we can do is we can group together the columns and the rows, and the reason, of course, why we can do that is uh, it's basically the exact same thing, um, just shifted over by one. Right? And so we can make a for loop and we can say for each column, you know, index 0, index 1, index 2. Um, I'm going to check, you know, uh, we, we can check the correct, whoops, I changed the thing again. We can check the correct column, which is the first index. So we'll call that I. And the first row, which is 0. So that gets us this value, right? or rather these top values, I should say. Uh, you know, i colon one would get us these three and i colon two would get us these three. And so what we can do is we can check is i colon zero equal to, you know, dot player equal to i one uh, and also make sure that it's equal to i two and then boom, we've just checked all three of these columns. Right. Of course, you know, when we want to do rows, we basically just swap these two positions and now we're checking horizontally instead. Um, and then if uh, it is true, if those three things are equal, uh, then we can run this line here, which is saying, you know, return the correct player. Um, that being said, you know, we, we do need to get the correct player and the correct player is in any one of those three squares. And so in this situation, you know, we're just getting the correct player in uh, you know, it, I guess in this situation, it would be uh, whatever the uh, correct column is that we're looking at, um, and, and we're just getting the first row, right? This could also be a one or a two, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, if this was flipped around, so if this was zero i, then we're saying whenever we're at the correct index, whenever we're at the correct row, um, you know, match the zeroth column in the ith row. Uh, and that's the correct player, right? Okay, next we want to check the diagonals. This is done the same. Instead of, you know, 0, i, or i, 0, you, you basically just have to check 0, 0, 1, 1, and 2, 2. And then for the other diagonal, there's not a great way of automating it. And so you do 2, 0. 1, 1, and 0, 2. And then, of course, if all of these if statements return false, then we just return none. And that's tic-tac-toe. Um, we have some bash. Uh, everyone did pretty well on the bash. I'm already 15 minutes over, uh, and so I won't go over that. Um, if you do have questions about bash, I encourage you to do office hours or campus wires, probably the best. Of course, be very patient um, about... Uh, you know, be, be very patient about um, probably office hours and uh, maybe your PMs as well over the next uh, 10 days because everyone has finals. Uh, and so, you know, um, if, if you're not getting the most prompt replies, uh, you know, they're probably grinding for some 
final. So, you know, um, that's all I have to say about that. Campus Wire is probably better because it allows people to answer asynchronously. Um, I'm also telling PMs to, you know, prioritize probably checking Campus Wire. And so you'll probably uh, get a much faster uh, response there if you do need help with one of these homeworks as you're going back. Um, okay, so sorry that I went a little bit over everybody. Um, nonetheless, I think this was super helpful. Hopefully this uh, clears up a lot of the confusion on some of these harder homeworks, again, that are all open until 11.59 p.m. CST, uh, March 14th, May, May 14th, not March, that was two months ago. Um, and so, you know, take some time, not right before a final, you know, study for your finals, um, get some points back. Um, you know, thank you all for your feedback. If you've been filling out the feedback forms, um, you know, I mean, honestly, the feedback forms are in incredibly valuable to us. Um, we, we make concrete changes uh, based on them every semester. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all for an awesome semester. I encourage you to come to the last social if you haven't, uh, you know, just to meet people. Um, thank you all. Uh, and, and yeah, just thanks for the opportunity to teach you all. I, I hope that you enjoyed this class. I hope that you learned a lot from it. I hope that it pushed you a little bit, honestly. Um, but, you know, uh, you're the, the best and the brightest, right? You're, you're taking an honors class. And so I hope that we exposed you to a lot of new concepts that uh, you will find interesting. And, and maybe, you know, some years from now, you'll um, uh, look back to. So thank you all. I, I hope that you have uh, a peaceful finals week, an easy finals week, and a wonderful summer. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to me on Discord, um, you know, about anything. And uh, of course, you know, uh, if you ever need help with anything, Matt and I, or any of the PMs for that matter, are always kind of here to, to help you, uh, even beyond the scope of this class. And so feel free to reach out for, you know, support or guidance or, you know, just uh, for a friend um, if you need that. So um, I, I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your semester and I'll see you around.